Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Hello, team. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for episode 10 of Whelmed Season 3. My name is Rich, and with me is my co-host, Emily. Hey, everybody. In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, themes, Easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else related to Young Justice. And then we'll use that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we'll be discussing all of them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. Buenas noches, Batman. I've been expecting you. No one gets on or off Santa Prisca without Bane knowing. Except the Cult of the Cobra, Aqualad, Robin, Kid Flash, Rocket, Zatanna. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily Fort. Hello, Megan. The title for this week's episode is Exceptional Human Beings. The release date was January 25th, 2019. The in-episode date was October 12th. The writer was Francisco Paredes. The director was Christopher Berkeley. And as always, the voice director was the amazing Jamie Thomason. Special guest voice credits this week uh, as both (laughs) Metamorpho and Slade Wilson, Fred Tadasiori. There's a thing where they just have people fighting themselves. It's a thing. And it's a, it's a thing, which I think is also funny, because Jacob Vargas voices Sebastian Cardona and Cisco Ramon, and Sebastian Cardona is one of the football players who picks on Cisco <laughs> in the locker room. Can you just insult yourself? Can you just it's do just that today all, for us? I don't know, it seems like there's a lot of episodes this season. Anyway, Danny Trejo is back as Bane, Danny Trejo, uh, and Gwendolyn Yao as uh, Lady Shiva. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode opens on what appears to be the Batwing, uh, a vaguely bat-shaped airplane of some kind, as Batman, Metamorpho, and Katana, with Oracle providing support via comms, uh, fly to Santa Prisca for a dark op. And once on the island, they split up to sneak through the jungle with Katana and Metamorpho working as a team, while Batman goes off on his own to investigate some things on this island full of evil. Classic, classic bats. We then cut over to Detroit, where Dr. Stone, the Star Lab scientist assigned to investigate the metahuman failsafe device from Triptych, gets a call from his teenage son, Victor, who reminds him of his football game happening later that night. He'll, to- he'll totally be there. He'll totally be there. It's going to be fine. Uh, their conversation, though, is interrupted by another call, this one from Steel of the Justice League, who informs Dr. Stone that a father box will be delivered to him for research and that he should be very careful with it. You know who I forgot to mention in the voice credits? Zeno Robinson. <laughs> Zeno Robinson talks to his dad... Zeno Robinson, Vic Stone, talking to his dad in the scene, and then I've got another call. And it's Zeno Robinson again. <laughs> Play, playing Steel. We love you, Zeno. We had a whole episode with him. Go listen to it. It's fantastic. He is an absolute delight. Back on Santa Prisca, Metamorpho and Katana continue sneaking past shadow guards in the jungle. And over in Happy Harbor, McGann and Connor spend the morning together while Nightwing's off training the new kids. <laughs> in the quarry, the dick seems to have permanently rented out or purchased. I think we talked about that last episode. Things seem to be going pretty well until Brion's flirting distracts Halo enough to make her fall out of the sky. Meanwhile, Jason Jefferson observe from above, talking about how everyone just wants to be wants the best for these kids. It's fine. And Rich has to fine, take Rich. a deep breath. See crashing the mode. Emily. On Santa Prisca, uh, <laughs> Metamorpho and Katana witness Lady Shiva training some new recruits for the League of Shadows. Uh, she then takes one of them, later revealed to be Cassandra Savage, off to speak with Deathstroke, who has just arrived. And this conversation is overheard by Batman, who watches from the shadows from a distance, as you do when you are Batman. <laughs> But on brand. Dur- <laughs> on brand. 
There's, if there was a gargoyle in that cave, it'd right. be he'd be perfect on brand, and also on brand for Greg Weissman. <laughs> But during that conversation, we learned that Tara Markov, the princess of Markovia, was part of the League of Shadows, at least temporarily, and Cassandra was her roommate. But apparently, she washed out of the program while Cassandra was away, though Deathstroke does mention that Granny Goodness might have some use for Tara. And while all that's happening, Brion gets into yet another fight with Nightwing about having patience and saving Tara. <laughs> Back in Detroit, we get qu- get a quick scene of Victor prepping for his football game before cutting back to Santa Prisca, where Batman's team plans to sneak aboard a ship, taking the latest Venom shipment off island. However, they're stopped by Bane, Lady Shiva, and Deathstroke, and a fight breaks out. While that's going on, we cut over to Star City, where Artemis signs Halo, now going by Violet Harper, up for high school. While his sister-in-law is doing paperwork, Will notices Cheshire lurking outside and goes to investigate. He invites her to come inside and stay with them, but Jade refuses, claiming that Will and Leon are both better off without her. Jade says goodbye and insists that she's not coming back and leaves with tears in her eyes. And while I'm recovering from that... I'm like, why? That, this is why you gave me that paragraph, right? <sighs> And while I'm recovering, we cut back over to Santa Prisca, where the fight continues with Batman versus Bane, who's apparently no longer using Venom to enhance his strength. Katana versus Lady Shiva, who wants to claim Katana's soul taker blade for her own. And Metamorpho versus Deathstroke, who finds out that Metamorpho is apparently bulletproof. These are all facts we learn here. Uh, During all of this, Oracle remotely pilots the Batwing, using it to destroy the weapons on Bane's ships before extracting Batman and his team from the island. To close out the episode, we see Victor Stone and some other high schoolers celebrating their football victory, complete with a college scout telling Vic that he could get a full ride to Metropolis University. But Victor's dad is nowhere to be seen because he's at Star Labs receiving the delivery of a very ominous looking father box. And Vic's life is going to be fine, and nothing bad's going to happen. I have this headcanon that Hal Jordan looked much better when he left with the father box than when he arrived. It's just so evil that he suddenly looks very haggard. Speaking of, let's feel the aster. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. So, feeling the aster. There's a lot this week. There's some cool stuff this week. Uh, and to start off everything, we have the ongoing question of who the heck knows about Oracle, because I yeah. realized on my 10 millionth watch through that everyone on Batman's team has Oracle in their in their heads up display. So why not Nightwing's team? Who's allowed to know about Oracle? I need answers. I don't get it. Will we ever learn? I don't know. Just just screaming forever. It's probably That's something. It's probably something really simple too, and I just can't see it. We'll find out. We'll just be like, really, R- really. That was it. That was really? the only reason. <laughs> but uh, speaking of Oracle, I had a nice little thing that I noticed, and I think a couple of people noticed that was Oracle saying that they're approaching the drop zone on Santa Prisca Island, right. which is a nice little callback since the first episode on Santa Prisca was called Drop Zone. I didn't notice it. The first couple times I saw it, but when I was watching it for this review, I saw I caught the same thing. I was like, yeah. oh, nice. It took us 10 million watch throughs. Well, we I was like, so oh. fascinated by like seeing Batman and Katana and Metamorpho all animated together. Like I was having Outsiders flashbacks. Yeah, it was awesome. But this episode also introduces us, besides Katana and Metamorpho and so many characters being brought in here, we also meet Victor Stone. Who's a who's a chill dude, and I like, and we'll talk more about him in Crashing the Mode. We will. I want to make a call. Like I talked to Zeno about this in our discussion session. Yeah. Like yeah. this Go thing, this scene was so important to me. The scene where he is trying to have a relationship with his dad, like a respectful, fun relationship. Because if you go back and read like Judas Contract or any of the early stuff um, in the in particularly in the seventies and the eighties, every black male character was angry black man. I mean, Tyrock from the Legion of Superheroes, Cyborg, like Black Lightning, all of these characters, like it was the only t- 
hype that they had. It was real pain. It's painful to go back and, and reread. And, and Vic was no different. Vic was, Vic was turned into the cyborg by his dad, who was a genius, but he didn't have any of these technical skills originally. And now they've done a much better job <laughs> of making him a well-rounded character. Yeah. But yeah. the thing that you see later, like you see when he gets upset, like, and he's upset with his dad in this, in this, even in this, this episode, right? You can see like, no, I get why you're upset. And also you tried, <laughs> right? Yeah. You, you tried having a relationship with your dad and your dad is a dumpster fire. You need to like, <laughs> I don't, that guy, I have very strong dad issues with the dads in this show. <laughs> Clearly. I got a thing about Deathstroke. In a minute, too. We'll, we'll get to it. <laughs> okay. We'll get to it. But, well, we're still on things that we that we like and are happy about. <laughs> S- stupid, happy, flirty Super Martian makes me predictably very happy. hmm <laughs> That's all we can say about that scene. Yeah. It's good, and it's cute, and it made me laugh, and I like it. They're good. <laughs> They're fine. Their, their fence is not having a problem. <laughs> Yeah, there's no fence issue. I don't know. It's, there's no mending that Hashtag needs to be going on. fence metaphor. <laughs> hashtag fence metaphor. I think we just need to get a shirt. It just has all the hashtags. It's just weird, weird, the weird way Emily processes things apparently it's, sometimes. It's hilarious. Speaking, speaking of people being cute, speaking of people being cute and flirty, this is the first time that we really get to see like it's not the first time but it's one of the first times we get the fact that halo and brion are are definitely flirting with each other because it's been touched on before a little bit uh but here we see that brion is going out of his way to attempt to flirt with halo and is a disaster man about it uh they're cute but it's hilarious how not subtle brion is just trying to be like you're exceptional you're so exceptional. And Nightwing's just like, Re- really? It says it like three times. And it's funny because this is like the exact opposite. Like as much as we make parallels between Connor and Brian, he is handling it exactly the opposite situation. Yep. He has no hiding his his feelings whatsoever. But I liked I liked Nightwing's thing where he just like looks at both of them and it's like, speaking of falling, like he's just like, <laughs> we're you're not. You're not sly. We know what's up. What are you? What are you kids doing? <laughs> it's like in what was it? Bereft or something? Get a room. <laughs> yeah, he's just. It does not matter how old Nightwing is in comparison to his teammates. He will just call them out on like you two are obviously <laughs> flirting. Just work it out. I appreciate it. Nice. It's good. Uh and in that same vein, I will point out that uh, kids not being able to control their powers because feelings is a good trope that I enjoy. It's the I whole like, reason I watch the show. It's, it's so <laughs> it's fun. It's fun and it's entertaining of seeing Halo being like, I'm so much better at not falling out of the sky. And then Brion's just like, you're pretty. And she's like, and now I'm falling out of the sky. Uh <laughs> And the fact that Brion literally just tries to like help her up and accidentally burns her hand and it's just like, I can't control this. Whoops. I don't. It's great. This is why teenage superheroes are fun because hormones mess with your powers and that's fun. <laughs> the great, great analysis from Emily Booza today. <laughs> but uh, we're going, we're going to, we're getting to the thing with Deathstroke because uh, there is a moment in this. Uh, where Deathstroke, when talking to Cassandra Savage, uh, says like, "So how are you? How are you settling back in, my dear?" And watching it this time, I was like, "Why are you calling her my dear? I don't like it. What are you doing? Yep, don't like it. Don't like it. Unlike the thing that we didn't like last episode, that I just don't need it in the show. I don't like this, and I and I'm fine with like not liking it. Yeah. But if I was Vandal, if I was her dad, I'd be like, "You want to rephrase that?" Or take a quick trip off this cliff face. <laughs> don't talk no. to my daughter that way. <laughs> don't talk to anybody. <laughs> do not do not talk to no. You want to shoot me? Shoot me. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, it's, not gonna it's, help you. <laughs> yeah, but it does. It does kind of reinforce that 
weird personality that Deathstroke has where he's like, he's threatening and he's creepy, but like he's weirdly trying to be personable all of the time. And I'm just like, it's yes. weird. It's weird on Deathstroke. And you know what? Hey, it's just a generational thing too. I mean, I don't know. But still, I didn't like, I was like, oh, dude, no. No, just don't. Slade, what are you, a villain? <laughs> What are you, the bad guy? <laughs> but that that conversation also gives us the revelation that Tara Markov and Cassandra Savage knew each other. They were roommates. <laughs> they were roommates, everyone. Uh, <laughs> and I want to know more about this. Like, I want, like, she says that, like, she was fond of her. I'm like, are they friends? Is Cassandra, like, her big sister? I don't know what the age difference is with these two characters because it hasn't been made clear oh, yeah, what age we don't Cassandra know actually Cassandra is. is. So, true. like, part of me is like, were they dating? What? Where are <laughs> right. we at with these two characters? <laughs> right. Give me that assassin girl backstory. So do you have any thoughts on that, Rich? <laughs> on what's up with these two girls? I have some I'm couching and crashing the mode. Okay. <laughs> I also just had thoughts about crashing the mode. Mm, yeah. So we'll we'll move we'll move along. We'll move along. Uh, <laughs> speaking of the same conversation though, I'm calling it now like this doesn't need to be in crashing the mode. I'm just calling it now cuz this is a wild flight of fancy. I think Lady Shiva and Deathstroke are going to throw down by the end of this season yeah. cuz that conversation between them was tense. <laughs> it was. And I tell you uh so aside from his his condescending comments. Uh, I'm a fan of Deathstroke when he's written particularly really well, but he's he's the Captain America of the DC universe, right? He's he's Batman plus. He when he's well written and he's had time to plan. I've seen him take down some of the most powerful leaguers sometimes at the same time, and I think Lady Shiva should hand him his eye patch. Yep, I think that's absolutely needs to happen. <laughs> I want to see that fight, and Me I want too. to see Lady Shiva win that fight, because I think she would. I think it would be a no contest. I'm saying it now. Um, yeah. We'll see. Fingers crossed. We'll see yeah. what happens. Mm -hmm. I also, with with this whole plot line, I do love how Bane has this thing where he's like, nobody gets on or off Santa Prisca without without me knowing. And Batman just responds with, except for the cult of the Cobra and Robin and Aqualad <laughs> and Kid Flash and Rocket, Rocket and Zatanna. And Zatanna. <laughs> just starts listing off everyone. But I realized on like the 10 millionth rewatch that he interestingly doesn't mention the rest of the team despite Bane meeting and interacting with both Superboy and Miss Martian. I, I, so I have two observations one, I think he was Go still listing it. characters when Bane <laughs> lost his temperature, temp, temp, his temper. And also, when was Rocket and Zatanna on the island? Was. That's a good question. Because they didn't get Wait. introduced until the end of season one. And. Remi I'm going to. I was gonna go. I was gonna say, was the temple thing on Santa Prisca? No, or the was temple was okay. in Bialia. Like that's. I was thinking it was in Vialia, but my brain was like, w "When have Rocket and Zatanna been somewhere together?" Because they weren't even. Were they in the end fight of season one when Superboy showed up on Santa Prisca? Yes, they had to be. Everybody was there for that fight. Everybody okay. was there for that fight. Okay, so that's when it was. I'm just having a hard time replaying that fight in my head for some reason. And I couldn't remember. Okay. So the end fight scene where they everybody tells everybody else they're being blackmailed. Yes. Okay. They were there. Okay. Then that's yeah. what it was then. I just couldn't but, I was like, when when was when was the Dana on the island? That's right. Yeah. So I think that must be that even because like the order of that seems kind of odd if he was still listing people. So my brain thinks that maybe he was just listing all of the people who are like publicly known because Batman's still keeping secrets even when he doesn't have to. <laughs> But I don't know. Also on brand. <laughs> right? So, like, so you've already met this hero, but the public doesn't know about this hero. So I'm still not going to say that this hero exists because I'm right. Batman. Right. But yeah, no, I like that. They have their whole big fight that, do you, that I think Neil was saying that he loved that giant fight scene between all of them because uh, it's good. It's <laughs> those like three mashups matchups on the island are good. It's a it's a cool fight. 
Uh, but my last stuff for this episode is actually about, <laughs> as no one is surprised, it's about the the Harper Wen Croc household and everything that happens there. Because I love this. Uh, I, one, really actually love that they bothered to acknowledge that somebody needs to sign Halo up for high school. <laughs> right. You may be a reanimated meta child, but high school is important and you must go. <laughs> We'll we'll see what happens with that. But as no one is surprised, I really, really, really love the scene between Will and Jade that we get this episode because it's all I ever wanted and they gave it to us and it's so good. It's cute and it's sweet, but it's also great for character development and great for like explaining these characters and where they're at this season. And just there's so many little things in it that I love. I love that he sees her immediately and goes out and like talks to her that that one he just knows and also two, he kind of sneaks he, up on her right yeah because she's like she's you still, haven't you haven't lost your touch or something yeah. like that because she's still up on the roof when he just comes out and like is like hey want to <laughs> want to come inside and she's like i didn't even know you were there uh but i like that he doesn't he doesn't point it out to artemis he doesn't make this a whole big thing this is just between the two of them i love i really like that she still calls him red because that's cute and that's a thing that we have kept through all three seasons and i like it even if he's not a superhero anymore she still uses it as a nickname uh and i like i realized rewatching it again uh i really like that they included the line of will saying because will says uh leon needs you and then follows it up with i need you too and i like that it's not framed as this being all about leon or the idea that like they need to stay together for their kid because that has its own problematic implications in it. It's about how Will wants this relationship too and wants to figure this out. And bothering to include that one little line for me makes this scene a lot deeper and a lot more meaningful for the two of them as a relationship. And yeah, I just like it. I like that literally I could break it down line by line and be like, I like this line because everything. But aren't you going to though? (laughs) Just not here? Yes. (laughs) I know I need to do a super sweethearts, but it's all of the things in this. It's the fact that Roy acknowledges that lurking is Cheshire's way of showing that she cares about people, which is hilarious. It's the fact that Roy is going out of his way to try and be flirty and funny. And Cheshire is the one who is like, no, I need to leave, which is so different from what we've seen from them in the past. The fact that she is crying when she walks away, which to me is like, yeah, no, you don't want to move on from this. You just feel that you have to for all of your things that you should be talking to a therapist about, about your childhood, but also because of your theory, <laughs> you want to go into what you think is happening, Rich? Well, I th- after this scene, I'm even more convinced that she is trying to stay away from them to protect them. Yeah. If it's true, if she doesn't, if she feels like the shadows don't know that Leon exists, because that all happened after she left the the shadows per the video game red arrow Timeline. journals. This is all ironically painful because they clearly know that Will and Leon exist because we just had home fires. Yep. So, but that again, since she didn't have Leon until afterwards, there's no reason why she should know that, that they know and et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know. I still think she's doing it to break. She's just too upset. And I just think she's doing it for some other reason. I'm really hoping that she is. I think it's a combination of all of the above. I think Cheshire has some genuine issues about what it means to be a mom and to be a family. And I think she also is doing this to protect them. I think it's all of the above. Layers upon layers. It's a good scene. It's a real cute scene. I'm going to, I promise I'll do a super sweetheart (laughs) soon. I promise. I promise it's happening. Absolutely. Neil pointed out something really interesting that I actually didn't catch, which is really cool. Um, Vic is attending uh, Haywood, at Haywood High School, home of the yes. Henry Haywood High Steelworkers. Henry Haywood is the name, and I don't, can't believe I didn't catch this, two DC heroes, uh, Commander Steel and Steel, who are both cybernetically enhanced. And if I remember correctly, Commander Steel was in the All-Star Squadron, along with some of the original uh, All-Star Squadron characters, like Stargirl from back in the day. So that's interesting. So that may be some historical references. I don't know. He said, I think Metamorpho could stand a stealth suit. And I'm like, really? 
He turned himself into a dumpster. I don't know <laughs> if he needs that. We'll see. Uh, he's of he's course brightly his... colored when he's not <laughs> being an actual dumpster. Yeah, and he has very, I, I think I've, I've mentioned this before, he has very plastic manny personality traits. <laughs> Kind of silly, bad joking and stuff like that. I can't remember if that was a part of who he was originally or if this is a new take. I'm not quite sure. I wouldn't know. Our number 16, uh, this episode at least, is Vic's jersey number, of course. I didn't even make this comment. I was thinking the same thing. Who eats that much ice cream? Superheroes, Rich. <laughs> Superheroes eat that it's much like ice cream. Each person had a tub of ice cream in that bowl. High superhero metabolism. <laughs> Four gigantic scoops, which is crazy. How much ice cream is too much ice cream? Yeah, exactly. You let, you let the storyboard artist decide. Katana's sword, right? They mentioned the yeah. soul the soul taker, right? Um, Neil brought this up too. She's a league member. Yeah. This is, a, this is not a weapon that knocks people unconscious. This is a, a bladed weapon that takes the souls of people who have been killed. And in the original story, if I remember correctly, Katana's either husband or I think it was her husband, his soul's in that sword that she can communicate with. And he's not the only one that's in there. And so this is the thing where where Shiva was saying, you know, uh, you've got the you have the superior weapon. Like it's a really powerful, magical weapon. But I'm just like, man, and she's a league member. (laughs) I'm like, I mean, there's a reason why she was in the Outsiders originally, right? And yep. I don't know. It's interesting. But it's like, so is, but so is Dr. Fate. And like, you think about it, it might be that same level of like, the league is like, you can be part of the league so we can keep an eye on you. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, we also saw Orphan <laughs> maybe <laughs> want to kill Mad Hatter. I don't know. So I guess that's a thing, I suppose. But I mean, come on, Bruce, you're, you're letting people run around with a lot of bladed weapons <laughs> here. I mean, even in the comics, Damien's got a katana as well. So, like, <laughs> hmm, interesting. It's um, fine. It'll it's all fine. be fine. <laughs> all right. And with no that, one ever died because of a katana. Not, not in comics. Unless their soul's taken out of it. All right. Let's take a break to the mid-roll. We'll come back with a quick canary debrief and more. Ah, yeah. Uh, welcome to the Fake Your Own Death Club. Its membership is very exclusive, and I'm the president. Hello, team, and welcome to the mid-roll. This year, Rooster Teeth's annual fan convention in Austin, Texas, takes place July 5th through 7th, and we understand that they're going to have exclusive access to panels and screenings from Young Justice. We also understand that Brandon Vietti will be on hand. So if you're going to be in Austin, Texas at the beginning of July, you can check out their website for tickets. We also have a new five-star review by Day 13 Intelligent conversation and excellent analysis. I found your show after you appeared on DC Universe, and I was impressed with your detailed perspectives and astute understanding of the show. Your approach intrigued me and inspired me to want to hear more. Hence, I've been binging your podcast for about three months. It's an awesome viewpoint, your guests are competent, and your attention to detail is refreshing. Both of you add your own thoughts and quality depiction of each episode, which is something I look forward to every time I tune in. I can't wait to catch up with your current schedule. I started from your first episode while re-watching Young Justice, and it's awesome to have your tutorial as I watch each episode. Thanks again for your insight, Dr. J. Thank you so much, Dr. J. And lastly, we'd like to welcome our newest Patreon backer, Nathan Greenberg. Nathan, welcome to Beta Squad. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the show. Stick around. Class is in session. In our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes we review. And today I want to talk about the importance of tight choreography. Today's debrief is about making sure that your character's action carry as much character weight and growth as the dialogue. Showing and not telling, right? With the exception of Oracle giving us team coordinating moments in this mission, the infiltration of Santa Prisca has no dialogue from the first moment we see Batman, Katana, Metamorpho until Bane calls Bats out. This is the first time we see Katana and Metamorpho, and even with Katana having no dialogue at all during the entire episode, we're shown exactly the kind of character that she is. This is especially true if you're writing comics. Back in the day, when I was 14, way back in 1984, 
Uh, I visited my best friend Steve's house, and he handed me a G.I. Joe comic that he had just got. It was issue number 21, and it was called Silent Interlude. It was the first comic that I know of that told its entire story with absolutely no dialogue. From the first page to the last page, it was about Storm Shadow infiltrating someplace in Southeast Asia, and it changed how I viewed comics forever. And you can see a TV version of this uh, as well in the horrifying Buffy the Vampire Slayer episode, Hush. But after the trying to make every scene that you write, draw, animate, or film carry the work without dialogue at all will help add layers and depth to your storytelling. In some cases, uh, like in the seminal Watchmen, you can tell a completely different story or parallel story with the actions than the dialogue is suggesting itself. So keep that in mind. All right, let's get into some fan service. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creation celebrating DC, Young Justice, and other creative works we think Young Justice fans will love. And uh, Emily, got us some fan service this week. I do, I do. And I have something kind of different for fan service, because this time around, I'm sharing a Spotify user's collection of Young Justice playlists that they've made. The person is Jose Sita, 1999, is how I'm going to say that. But they've made a bunch of fan-made playlists for the entire original YJ team and a few other YJ characters as well. I think they also have ones for all of the Robins from DC Comics. Uh, And I've only listened to bits and pieces of each one and haven't had a chance to like sit down and listen to all of them uh, all the way through the way that I would want to. But the pieces that I've heard have included some really great choices for each of the characters. So if you want a fun little character study through music, definitely check them out. But as a quick disclaimer, I will point out some of the songs on these playlists do include explicit language that is not technically PG PG friendly. So maybe don't listen while you have some super young kids in the car, but otherwise check them out. Have a have a fun time with some cool playlists. <laughs> awesome. All right, let's crash the mode. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in Season 3. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. These spoilers will be based only on the first 13 episodes, as that's all that we've seen at this time. If you are spoiler-wearing, this is your warning. Um... Halo is a mother box. Halo is a mother box. To start off, we got to mention that the mother box, um, that's Halo. And I don't know where I was reading this. And I think someone shared this with me from Reddit. So if someone can help us give credit to this person who came up with this idea, I'd appreciate it. And I was thinking about this when we were reading the, um, the recap today. So we've been talking about how Tara has this just uh, almost like storytelling momentum, right? The Judas Contract, the Titans uh, animated series, this kind of stuff. She she comes in, she works with Deathstroke, she's going to betray everybody, right? And I'm like, yes. Young Justice, you either got to go with that or you're going to change it and you're going to make it unexpected like they've done with so many things. How do they make it unexpected? Someone on Reddit has the theory that the, the Terra that gets rescued at the end of this season isn't Terra at all. It's Macomb. And Emily has left the screen. So when Deathstroke says she washed out, that may actually have happened. The Terra that Cassandra was with may have been the actual Terra, but that may not be the Terra that they set up that goes on to do this thing. I will repeat, this theory is not mine. This theory was shared with me, and I'm pretty sure that it was from a Reddit thread. So I want to give credit to whoever that credit's due. So somebody please message us about that. But yeah, because we haven't seen Macomb in a while, too. So we have long pauses. Emily's processing. Yeah. I had a different theory, but it's nowhere as crazy as that theory. Okay. Give me your less crazy theory. Related to the, just related to the idea of how do you keep Tara's storyline interesting Mm -hmm. when we have seen it so many times and part of me was thinking part of how you 
could make it more interesting on this, which we almost started to touch on, and then we're like, wait, no, crashing the mode, is that they have set up that her and Cassandra know each other and seemingly have some sort of connection, whatever level of connection that is. And even just including the idea that, like, Tara has friends who are villains now is interesting because most of the time the way this story is handled is you just have her be like here's Deathstroke he manipulated this teenage girl into doing whatever he wants and now she has to be saved by our heroes and become a good person yeah but you give her like an actual real connection with another character who is closer to her age and who she has some level of friendship with that makes that so much more complicated. It does. And the fact that we've already seen Cassandra and she and and really, I, for me anyway, I really understand why she thinks her father is the savior of humanity. Cassandra hasn't been presented as a villain at all in this entire show. No. So if she's with Tara and she's making this pitch, like this isn't her manipulating Tara. This is like, no He's been trying, he's been literally saving the world for 50,000 years. Yep. And Tara might be just like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, right? Yeah. This is, this is it. Cause what experience did she have before then with heroes or anything? I mean, I just, I don't see that. So like, I like, I like your theory a lot that she's actually there for a reason, right? And, and really invested. Um, but the other thing that's interesting is that they had mentioned, <laughs> Even even in the scene where theoretically Tara kills that guy, the the developer, the good goggles developer with Black Spider, they say, well, it could have been somebody with telekinesis or somebody with super strength. And I'm like, yeah, that could totally have been Macomb. <laughs> Absolutely. And where's the real Tara? Don't know. But it's been but as we mentioned. They said she was abducted two years ago, which was right at the end of the second season, which means it must have been the very early days of the MetaHuman project. So she's one of the very first metas that was yeah. taken. So she may not have survived or I don't know. I, I don't know. But this Macomb thing makes a lot of sense and is really what, what it could lead to, too, is that maybe she is still alive. She is somewhere. They, they it, it is Macomb. Right. But Tower is still alive somewhere and needs to be still needs to be rescued. And we have a reason to have Tara be an actual hero instead of, you know, later on in later seasons, instead of having, you know, what we're what we expect from Judas contract. I don't know. The one thing I was so I was processing all of this and was thinking about whether or not it could work. But then I remembered that we see Miss Martian meet Tara. She's in a group that has Tara at some point in the in like episode thirteen, and Miss Mar and we've proven that Miss Martian can recognize Macomb even when he's in shape shifting. No, what she said was, "Is I'm sensing a psychic influence here." Okay, and he was influencing the bugs at the time telepathically. So I think, and and you might not be wrong, I'm just thinking like, I'm pretty sure in that scene, the reason that she knew who it was, was because he was actively using psionic powers at the time, and she recognized like the flavor or the sound of his psionic powers. Yeah. So it's it's still possible, but I I think you're right. That's a a pretty big hole you just punched in, but... (laughs) I'm sorry. I didn't want to ruin it. No, no, you didn't ruin it. I I just... (laughs) You didn't ruin anything. My thought process of having him, of being like, oh, Macomb is Tara, that would mean that would at first my brain was like, that explains why everyone trusts her so quickly because psychic influence. Mm. But then my brain was like, but Miss Martian would be like, what are you doing, little brother? Why do you keep doing this? So I don't know. I don't know. We'll I see. Don't know either. We'll see. We we'll trust see. no one. Trust we trust no one. No one. <laughs> Hi, welcome to Whelmed, where yeah. we trust no one. <laughs> anyway, that was my pretty and much. That was pretty much my big one. What you got? So, speaking of not trusting anyone, uh, Jace continues to be to be untrustworthy <sighs> oh. uh, because they have Jefferson mention that she called Brion and Halo her kids. Yeah, and is like, he's just kind of casually like, "What's up with that? Why?" Why? Why would you say something that weird? And 
the way that it's phrased, I realized on the 10 millionth watch through is he says, don't you mean your kids? And she goes, what are you talking about? Is what is her first question. Yeah. Seemingly to try and figure out how much he knows or what he knows or what he thinks he knows. Because once he says, that's what you said yesterday when that went down. And she goes, oh, I guess I'm just really protective of them. Ha ha. Brush that off. Move on. And I'm just like, hmm. Protective or possessive? A. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, that's where I'm going now. Because after last episode of after our last episode, I am horrified by her. <laughs> We've gone from like vaguely mistrusting Jace to just being terrified of this woman. It's it's crazy. Yeah. The other thing. Yeah. Uh, touching on uh, cyborg for a bit here. Yeah. Um, because there's a lot. He's going to be cyborg next episode. It's coming up. Father box cyborg. Ta-da. Crashing that mode, um, which isn't, it's just, I, I've got no insight there. But one thing that I did think was interesting going back and rewatching this is there is the scene in the locker room that is just a bunch of boys talking about which member of the Justice League they would date <laughs> right. uh, and Victor not caring and moving on. <laughs> Where uh, Jacob Vargas is picking on himself. Yes. <laughs> uh, and for a while, I kept being like, this is a funny scene. But what does it add to the story? Yeah. And I realized on the 10 millionth time through what I, an idea I came up with is that I find it really interesting that with that scene, they don't go out of their way to present Victor as a hero. Because you watch that scene and the first time through, if you're watching this, knowing who Victor Stone is, knowing he becomes cyborg, knowing he becomes a superhero, you're like, oh, they're going to have him stick up for Cisco. And be like defender of people who can't defend themselves, right? Hero, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It's the easy hero foreshadowing move. But they don't do it because Victor doesn't want to be a hero. Right. That's not what he wants. He just wants to be a normal kid who gets to go play football. Yeah. And he's not participating in the conversation about the Justice League, not sticking up for the kid who's getting thrown into a locker. Yeah. He's just trying to live his life and worrying about his own problems. Right. Which with his dad are not insignificant. Yes. I mean. Which I think is a really nice, really cool, subtle way of setting up for his later conflicts that are about, I don't want this. Him being one of the characters that we see with superpowers who is very actively like, I don't want any of this. I don't want to have super strength. I don't want to be part robot. I don't want to save the world. I just want high school and football and college. Yeah. Do you think they're going to let me catch a football with this thing? <laughs> He's talking about his hand. It's so good. Uh, so good. So good. But yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm a hundred percent on board with your thing. Cause they just spend that whole scene talking about heroism and what it is and what would it be and what would you do with powers? And he's like, I'd focus on the game. Let's go. <laughs> like That's it. I love it. I think it's great. And it also shows like, he's not ready. Like, even though we see him in later, you know, these episodes where he's around these, you know, uh, other freaks, he's not like, Hey, I want to jump in and join this team. He's just like, okay, I'm here because I have nowhere else to go. I literally have nowhere else to go. Because everyone else is approaching their powers as how do I learn how to use this? And every one of uh, Cyborg scenes after he gets the cybernetic implants is like, how do I fix this? How do I get rid of this? Who can fix me? Right. I'm with you guys because you guys seem to know how to fix this. Right. Please fix it. Well, and at least one of you can keep me from murdering everyone. So yeah. that's helpful. Because yeah. Halo's a mother box. Because Halo's a mother box. Did we mention that already? This I think we did. I think so. Okay. But. Just to make sure. We'll open and end with Halo's a mother box. Yes. And with that, we can say it out of the Watchtower. Thank you for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at WhelmedPodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. Or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, reviews, and subscriptions help others find the show. 
And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S. because we have to look a little harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.